Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Celebrating Act 2 with our special guest today, John Mariani. How are you doing, John? I am very well, thank you. How are you, Art? I am excellent. Excellent. <laughs> oh, we're not talking about eggs. What are we talking about today, John? We're, we're talking about hunger. Um, hunger. Every My weekly pizza. And I think mm. if you could see a full shot of me, you'd tell that I love my weekly pizza. We were discussing pizza the other night, and uh, I had re this recollection, I don't know where I read it or heard it, that pizza was an American invention. Uh, is that is pizza really an Italian food, John? I am speechless, John. Yes, it is really an Italian food. True Italian, made originated in Italy? Yes. Although you could slice the, the the onion a little bit more slender, it's a Neapolitan dish. It is oh. not an Italian dish, and there are historical reasons for that that I will go into, depending upon how long you'd like to have me on. <laughs> well, now that you've corrected him, will you also go into Sicilian pizzas if we get a chance? I shall. Thank you. Well, let's start with Neapolitan. Ne it, 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 that's up north. Yeah. That's a, well, it's not real up north. The, the Italians consider that way south, but uh, south of Rome. Anything south of Rome is way south. Um, the story of pizza is very, very specific as to a time and place of its creation, at least pizza as we know it today. The Italian word, a Neapolitan word, pizza, means kind of to pluck something, like you pluck it out of an oven. Or like pita, pita bread. Now, flat bread is known all over the Mediterranean, pita breads, Greece and Turkey, and so that's what, that's what they eat. Uh, what happened was that the tomato had only recently come to southern Italy from America. And it was considered a, a poisonous plant, actually, because uh, you fed it to animals, uh, because it was a member of the deadly nightshade family. Um, so the botanists say, oh, don't, eat, don't eat those things, even though it was a fruit, not a vegetable. So the Neapolitan being poor said, we're going to take a crack at it and eat it. And they say, whoa, tomatoes are terrific. Don't tell the northern Italians about this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they then had this new fruit, this new vegetable. They already had mozzarella, and they already had beautiful, fragrant basil um, herb, herb uh, growing around there in southern Italy. So what happened was that um, a guy had had a pizza oven where he would bake these flatbreads, and his name was Raffaele Esposito. So you're, you're te hold on just a second. You're telling me that pizza has a actual definitive historical origins in a specific place in Italy with a specific guy and what was the year? 1864. You know, I'm going I'm going to pick it up. I think they might even be here picking up my own dictionary of Italian food and drink. And uh, let's see if I have a Oh, and who wrote that book, John? John Mariani. <laughs> and, and, and can people, ordinary people, uh, get a copy of that? Uh, yes, this is also available on uh, Amazon.com, as are all of mine. Okay, June 11th, 1889. Wow. That will live in history because that's when Raphael Esposito and other pizzaiolo makers of Naples were invited to submit their pizzas for the arrival of the queen consort uh, Margarita, um, who's married to uh, Victor Emmanuel II, uh, following the um, uh, reunification of Italy into an actual nation rather than a bunch of city-states like, like Sicily and Tuscany and Umbria and so forth. So yeah. in honor of the new um, Italian flag, which was three stripes, red, white, and green, um, what he put on top of this flatbread was mozzarella cheese, white, uh, tomato, red, and basil, green, and served it up, and apparently it was an enormous hit, and it got a lot of publicity. Okay, this is way back in 1889. That became named after Margarita. That's the pizza a la Margarita, and that's how the pizza was, in fact, born. And nobody outside of Naples ate pizza for years and years and years. Um, they didn't even have tomatoes in the north until they started canning them. Uh, maybe years later, so if you went to if you went to 
Milan or Florence or, or Rome as of uh, 1898, 2010, 2030. You'd never find a pizza there. This is very specifically a Neapolitan um, creation. But you would find a pizza in the eastern cities of America because the Neapolitan immigrants came to America, opened up little ristorantes and trattorias, including the first pizzeria in 1906, which is on Spring Street in New York in uh, Little Italy, and it was called G. Lombardi's, and it still exists today. And that wow. was in America. You and know, I, my guess is that um, uh, we will eventually get to, uh, because both all three of us grew up in the New York area, although <clears throat> Coleman and Kirsch are Luddites, so we, we, we're not subject to much change, but we're not a gourmet of any sort. Uh, well, we probably are of a very poor sort. Uh, but uh, we know that pizza is properly eaten by the slice folded in your hand. Uh, but are there other ways to eat pizza? As a matter of fact, you are right. Uh, that is the New York Eastern Seaboard way to fold it. But actually in Italy, you will find them it's on a plate and they cut it with a knife and fork. And Mayor de Blasio got into all sorts of nonsensical criticism because he was visiting his hometown in Italy and he ate a pizza with a knife and fork. And everybody, what an idiot, what a moron, you know. Well, that's how they do eat it over there, even though he's a New Yorker. But, um, yeah, that's, that's the way you eat it. And there are, of course, slice joints, places you go for pizza because they serve it by the slice, and other places where you sit down to have it, the whole pizza and take out. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that um, pizza is obviously cheaper to open in America than a real restaurant. But as pizzerias got more profitable and their owners got more uppity, they wanted to open an Italian restaurant. And very often they shut down the pizzerias within those um, their own restaurants only to 50, 60 years later when pizza has again become now a gourmet item. They are now serving pizzas at the top of their menu and even the fanciest of Italian restaurants. You know, I know in, in uh, New York we had uh, 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 the pie and you'd eat it by the slice. And uh, but, uh, my favorite was always Sicilian, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, very thick and, and, and rich, came in a, in a heavy metal pan, uh, mm -hmm. square. Uh, how did sure. that come about? How what? How did that come about, the Sicilian uh, pizza? It, it was just that Sicilians, Americans, who knew a good thing when they uh, could catch on to it, uh, were the ones that said, well, if the Neapolitans are going to make this way, we're going to make ours in a pan, as a pan. So, so Sicilian pizza, again, oh. is an authentic Sicilian variation. It's not, it, a, it's it not a New York, some guy said, I need to come up with a different version. It's a real Italian pizza. Yeah, it, it, oh. it is. But uh, as Art suggests, it's a thicker crust. And, you know, then we get into the whole history of thicker and thinner crust because the uh, East Coast pizza uh, tends to be a slightly puffier, yeastier crust, as in Naples. But in Naples, and there's a famous place called Santa Brigida, where Raffaele Esposito once worked, and there they make it the very traditional way. And while the outside is fully cooked and, and has the bubbles on it and, and char and so forth. The middle is um, soft. So you pick it up, and that's what a Neapolitan, Neapolitan New York pie is. The middle is soft. Well, along in the 1980s came a place called Paper Moon out of Milan. And they call it Paper Moon uh, in, in English. And it was a pizzeria in Milano where they're very stylish and it's a fashion capital and and uh, nobody wants to eat big, fat pieces of bread and stuff. So they sort of created the thin crust pizza, which became all the rage simply because it was associated with the new Milanese style and what models eat and what fashionable people want to eat. Oh, I can eat two or three slices of thin crust pizza rather than one of those big, fat Sicilian jobs. And that's how the thin crust of pizza became so popular. Now, I... I guess I'm under this all this misimpression that pizza was not a truly uh, Italian food um, because of people like Wolfgang Puck, who, uh, at least according to the press, reinvented pizza. What happened there when somewhere along the line, maybe it was Wolfgang Puck, created gourmet pizza? 
Well, you're right. It was actually uh, two uh, two California restaurateurs, Wolfgang Puck at uh, Spiaggia, which is in um, uh, Hollywood, or Sunset Boulevard, and also up in Berkeley, California, uh, Alice Waters, um, who ran a French restaurant up there called Chez Panisse, opened atop that restaurant a um, more casual eatery, which is called Cafe uh, Fanny, um, named after a, a, a star of, uh, of French movies. And there she says, well, let's serve really, really good pizzas. And they both developed um, what became known as gourmet pizzas, only because, again, and fashion style has so much to do with this. Um, she was so well known for her great French cuisine. So for her to put lamb sausage on this beautiful crust and serve it upstairs from Chez Panisse was quite a phenomenon. Meanwhile, Wolfgang Puck would open Spiaggia as what he thought was going to be quite a simple little restaurant, mainly based on the grill and the oven, rather than sautéing and, and boiling and, and braising and so forth. He served pizza there, and um, he got a very, right from the start when he opened, he got a big celebrity clientele. Kirk Douglas came in the first night, and uh, uh, all, all of these, these famous people, which, which they um, um, coaxed. But the biggest hit among all of his food was what he called the Jewish pizza. And the Jewish pizza, Wolfgang Puck is Austrian, so I'm doing his impeccable Austrian accent. Uh, the Jewish <laughs> pizza was a flatbread, which was uh, had on top smoked salmon and sour cream and caviar. And those are favorites of uh, Jewish delis, um, although they probably use uh, red salmon roe rather than real caviar. Sounds he, good to me. Pizza, sorry? It, it sounds good. Yeah, oh, it, oh, it is absolutely delicious. And some people, including myself, say, well, it's not authentic, but it's no more authentic than, God forbid, California pizza, you know, which supposedly created the Hawaiian pizza with pineapple on top, which sends Italians or even anybody who likes pizza at all into absolute madness, craziness. <laughs> and yeah, it's well, the one... Well, my dear raise my other. hand on raise my hand on that uh, a pizza with with uh, they have a ham and they have uh, a, a pineapple and they have a hot pepper whatever I guess is popular locally but then again the first authentic pizza in Italy was made up and somebody made up and threw tomatoes on a a piece of bread so I guess you know I just I it's let them eat it in peace. It's certainly open to interpretation, uh, any food is, but they're good and bad versions. And there is something called the uh, Vera Napoletana Pizzeria Association, which if you want to get their certificate of, uh, of approval, you have to use a certain amount of a certain flour made from durum wheat. You have to use San Marzano tomatoes, which you can readily buy because they're canned. And you have to use true, fresh, <clears throat> whole mozzarella. If you don't use those things, you can do other little variations, but if you don't use those things and cook it exactly so that the cornichon, corticone around the edge is of a certain height, you won't get their approval. And I, I, I do tend to agree with that. Now, can you put other things on top of it? Yeah, but it's like saying, well, you know, French fries. You can make French fries out of tofu, can't you? Well, oh, I suppose you can, but mm -hmm. I don't call it a French fry potato anymore. Right. But, you know, so, so I, I guess uh, it, it comes down to... Uh, people can have what they want, but uh, it is an Italian dish. It w was invented in uh, uh, Italy. But John, uh, to give you some credit, it was perfected in New York. And that's, <laughs> that's perhaps where the confusion comes in. Actually, I think the best pizza was Giovanni's in Nourishell on the Boston Post Road. They did have a very good pizza. Oh, and growing up both in the Bronx and and, and uh, Westchester County, there's good pizzas all all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, it's a, a staple. Yeah. Yep. Or, John, you say people can do what they want with with food. You know, it's up to them and the taste. But as the great Italian Willie Nelson once said, if it wasn't for bad taste, that guy would have no taste at all. <laughs> well, well, this is this has been wonderful to learn about the history of a true staple a food that is ubiquitous, pizza. And somewhere in the future, John, we're going to talk about the second most important food in the world, equally as ubiquitous, the hot dog. 
But that's for another. That's for another time. That's for another time. Well, thank you, John and John, and it's been another great uh, uh, and fun session. And uh, we thank you for all the travels and and research that you've done, eating all these low these many years. Uh, to uh, bring us these fun facts. Thank you. And, and John, correct me if I'm wrong. It's the Encyclopedia of Food. Give us the correct title of your book. Hold it up. Okay, there's the Dictionary of Italian Food and Drink, and then there's the Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, and um, then there's, oh, a whole lot of others that uh, <laughs> I'm writing as fast as I can. So, many, so, many if, they, books. so if they go to the uh, uh, virtual, uh, to johnmariani.com, and they can uh, uh, peruse all the little titles there, uh, and big titles, some of them are longer, uh, and and read your uh, novel, Love and Pizza, which we haven't spoken about for a while. Okay, but uh, then they can find out which ones they might be interested in, go to Amazon and purchase them. Yeah, Love and Pizza is a, a lovely novel that I wrote with my heart. It's about the, a Bronx girl, real smart cookie, goes to Columbia University, goes to Italy, falls in love, and... <sighs> Troubles ensue. With that, with that note, uh, uh, to get people to come visit the site, uh, and it's well, well worth the read. I, I think we were up to thir in the late high thirties, uh, early forties uh, on chapters. So it's a great, it, it, it's lots of reasons to keep going back to uh, uh, johnmariani.com. So thank you again, and uh, look forward to seeing my two favorite Johns. Uh, in See the you soon, future. John. Ciao, bambini. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.